I'm Patty Bruner, and you're listening to Truth of the Spirit. One of the goals of the Truth of the Spirit podcast is to remind you of the Spirit-filled facets of our Christian faith, our Catholic faith, sometimes returning to the basics to allow you to better have access to the teachings and actions of those inspired by the Holy Spirit, especially throughout the church. Please join me now as Truth of the Spirit continues the Basics of Faith series by sharing the basics of the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. I'm Patty Bruner. What is the real presence? You know, Jesus Christ is present, body, soul, and divinity, in the Eucharist, under the appearances of bread and wine. The presence of the risen Christ in the Eucharist is beyond our understanding. It is an inexhaustible mystery, something that not even the church can explain by reason. Yet, the infallible teaching authority of the Catholic Church has proclaimed it for nearly 2,000 years because God reveals His truth to us in ways that we can understand through the gift of faith and the grace of the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. You see, God is a perfect teacher And he shows us the ways to learn and accept the truth about the real presence. Jesus said, take and eat, this is my body. Recalling these words of Jesus, the Catholic Church professes that in the celebration of the Eucharist, bread and wine become the body and blood of Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit and the instrumentality of the priest. The doctrine of the real presence is found in the sixth chapter of John's Gospel, where Jesus himself teaches about the Eucharist and about faith. We are not the only ones who need faith to accept the truth about the real presence. Even Jesus' own disciples needed it. In fact, as we read chapter 6 of John's Gospel, we will see how many of Jesus' own disciples lack the faith required to believe in the real presence. And these were people who had enough faith to believe that Jesus was God. Before the resurrection, the divinity of Jesus was veiled by his humanity. Yet, the disciples believed. We have the benefit of the rest of the story, of the resurrection, of the eyewitnesses, and the fullness of the gospel and the New Testament writings. And we believe that Jesus is true God and true man. To believe that Jesus is present in the Eucharist requires an even greater faith because the Eucharist veils both his divinity and his humanity. This is why Jesus stresses the theme of faith so strongly at the same time he reveals his teaching on the Eucharist. In the Eucharistic discourse of John chapter 6 verses 35 to 69, Jesus clearly teaches that we must consume his flesh and blood as food, such as verse 51. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. And the bread I give is my flesh for the life of the world. And verse 53, Amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, 
you do not have life within you. And verse 55, my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. You cannot decide that Jesus was speaking symbolically because everyone who heard Jesus that day understood him to be speaking literally of his body and blood. The objecting Jews in verse 52 say, How can he give his flesh to eat? And his unbelieving disciples in verse 60 say, The saying is hard. Who can accept it? Many of these disciples had lived and eaten and walked with Jesus for nearly two years. They spoke the same language as Jesus, day in and day out. They heard him use different methods to get his points across to the crowds and to those he called by name. Truly, sometimes he used parables and symbols and comparisons and metaphors, but they also heard him speak literally, meaning exactly what he said. These same disciples understood perfectly that Jesus meant precisely what he said. Many of whom quit following Christ because he said it, and Jesus let them leave. Instead of explaining that his listeners had just misunderstood him, that he was only speaking figuratively, Jesus, using the strongest possible language, emphatically repeats the literalness of this teaching. Six times in six verses, verses 53 to 58. In verse 53, he says, Amen, amen. I truly, truly. You know, when Jesus says, Amen, amen, there's no doubt that what he says is not true. And he says, Amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. Now, that life within you is going to be the Holy Spirit within us. So unless we could eat the flesh and drink the blood of Christ, we would not have that communion with Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. And then verse 55, my flesh is real food and my blood real drink. This is not the language of symbolism. He didn't say this is like. So so one of the Protestant versions says uh, this is like. No, you can't add that word like in that scripture because Jesus did not say that. He said this is real food and my blood real drink. It's hard to believe. It's next to impossible. But it is truth. It is the truth of the Spirit that we believe through faith and grace. Now, many of Jesus' own disciples can't accept the literalness of his teaching and leave him. You can see that in verse 66. Notice that Jesus doesn't call him back. Again, our explain that he's only speaking figuratively, as he did on the previous occasions when they mistook his words, literally. They just couldn't accept it. Even the twelve apostles were shaken. And it seems that the same thing that happened to Jesus is happening in the church today. According to a Catholic national telephone poll uh, by CARA, C-A-R-A, of Catholics, the percentage of Catholics who believe in the real presence is decreasing. That is Catholics in general. Belief in the real presence varies for Catholics who have identified according to their attendance at Mass. So, 91% of Catholics who attend Mass weekly or more 
believe in the real presence. But the percent of believers who miss Mass a couple times a month, that drops from 91% down to 65% who believe in the real presence. And the Catholics that attend Mass only a few times a year, I call them the CEO Catholics, you know, the Christmas, Easter only Catholics, well, only 40% of them believe that Jesus Christ is really present in the bread and the wine of the Eucharist. Now, this is a Catholic poll. I found that non-Catholic polls uh, show even lower numbers. I guess their pool contains people who say they're Catholics but don't re- don't attend Mass, perhaps. It's pretty obvious that the Catholics who do not believe in the real presence of Jesus find excuses for not attending Mass every week and perhaps stop believing in the other teachings of the Catholic Church and eventually leave altogether. But when his disciples started leaving him, Jesus didn't compromise. No, not one bit. And we cannot compromise today either. The truth is the truth. Instead, he challenges his own hand-picked apostles. In verse 67, he says, will you also go away? And in faith, Peter answers, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. That's verse 68. Yet, even one of the twelve apostles turned away and rejected this teaching of Jesus, the apostle Judas, who rejected and betrayed Jesus. Now, we have two choices. We can either doubt, like the unbelieving Jews and disciples, or believe, like Peter, that somehow Christ will accomplish his promise. Jesus fulfills his precise promise to give his flesh and blood as food and drink at the Last Supper. During each consecration at Mass, we continue to hear the all-powerful words of Christ. This is my body. This is my blood. And the bread and the wine are completely changed into Christ's actual flesh and blood. This is my body which will be given for you. Okay, so on that Holy Thursday... At the Last Supper, he says, this will be given for you. He's entering into the internal moment of the crucifixion that will take place the next day on Good Friday. And so when we receive the body and blood of Christ, when we hear those words, we're entering into that eternal moment of the consecration of his body and blood Jesus equates his body and blood given in the Eucharist with his body and blood sacrificed on the cross. This is my blood of the covenant, which will be shed on behalf of many for the forgiveness of sins. We identify the body and blood he gives at the Last Supper as the very same body and blood that he will sacrifice on Calvary because Jesus did. If we accept the body and blood offered on the cross as literal, as all Christians do, then we must also accept the body and blood offered in the Eucharist as literal. For Jesus said, my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. The whole Christ is truly present, body, blood, soul, and divinity, under the appearances of bread and wine. The glorified Christ, who rose from the dead after dying for our sins. This is what the church means when it speaks of the real 
presence of Christ in the Eucharist. The USCCB, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, realizes that we might still have questions about the real presence, and so they anticipated some of these questions and published the answers in a great brochure, such as, if the apostles consumed Jesus' real body and blood, wouldn't they be committing cannibalism? Furthermore, wouldn't this violate the biblical prohibition against drinking blood? The answer is no. It was precisely this misunderstanding that led the unbelieving Jews and disciples in John 6 to reject Jesus when they said they must eat his body and drink his blood. They thought Jesus was commanding them to consume him in a bloody, physical way. However, the believing disciples were rewarded for their faith at the Last Supper. Jesus revealed that they would receive his true body and blood sacramentally, present in a hidden way. While the apostles truly consumed Christ's real body and blood, it wasn't cannibalism because Christ wasn't in his natural condition. They didn't bite off pieces of Christ's arm, for example, and swallow quantities of his blood. Instead, they received Christ whole and entire, body, blood, soul, and divinity under the appearances of bread and wine. Christ was present at the Last Supper in two ways at the table with his disciples in a natural way, and under the appearance of bread and wine in a sacramental way. Just because we can't understand how God does something is no reason to doubt that he does it. Many Christians' beliefs are beyond our comprehension. All Christians accept the mysteries of the Trinity the Incarnation, Creation, and God's Omnipresence. If we can accept the overwhelming mystery of Christ's divinity, we should have no trouble accepting His teachings, however difficult they may seem. Consider the witness of St. Paul in his first letter to the Corinthians. The cup of blessing that we bless Is it not a participation of the body of Christ? The only way we participate in Jesus' body and blood through the Eucharist is if his body and blood are really present in the Eucharist. The early church fathers are our bridge to Christ and his apostles. That bridge is unmistakably, undeniably, Catholic. The early church fathers preserved both the written and oral teachings of the apostles. Virtually every distinctly Catholic doctrine is clearly found in the writings of the early church fathers of the first, second, third, and fourth centuries, and this includes the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, the Mass as a sacrifice, apostolic succession, the primacy of Peter, an accessory prayer to the saints, devotion to Mary, purgatory, and confession to a priest. The evidence of the early church fathers proves that primitive Christians were Catholics. And early fathers prove that early Christians firmly believed in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Virtually all Christians accepted the doctrine of the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist until the Reformation. Now Martin Luther, who started the Reformation, believed in the real presence, but not in the authority of the Pope. And once that authority was gone, The Protestant movement splintered into thousands of sects, and the belief in this difficult truth 
all but disappeared, except for those who have remained faithful to the teaching of Jesus through the Catholic Church. Let's look at some more of the basic questions surrounding the real presence. Why does Jesus give himself to us as food and drink? Jesus gives himself to us and the Eucharist as spiritual nourishment because he loves us. By eating the body and drinking the blood of Christ in the Eucharist, we become united to the person of Christ through his humanity. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. In being united to the humanity of Christ, we are at the same time united to his divinity. So our humanity needs to be united to his humanity to be able to sit at the Father's right hand within him in his divinity. Our mortal and corruptible natures are transformed by being joined to the source of life. Why is the Eucharist not only a meal, but also a sacrifice? While our sins would have made it impossible for us to share in the life of God, Jesus Christ was sent to remove this obstacle. His death was a sacrifice for our sins. Through his death and resurrection, he conquered sin and death and reconciled us to God. The church gathers to remember and to represent the sacrifice of Christ in which we share through the action of the priest and the power of the Holy Spirit. Through the celebration of the Eucharist, we are joined to Christ's sacrifice and receive inexhaustible benefits. Jesus, the eternal Son of God, made his act of sacrifice in the presence of his Father, who lives in eternity. Jesus' is one perfect sacrifice is thus eternally present before the Father, who eternally accepts it. This means that in the Eucharist, Jesus does not sacrifice himself again and again, rather by the power of the Holy Spirit is one eternal sacrifice is made present once again, represented so that we may share in it. The Eucharist is also the sacrifice of the church. The sacrifice of Christ becomes the sacrifice the members of his body who united to Christ form one sacrificial offering. Now this is covered in the Catechism, paragraph 1368. As Christ's sacrifice is made sacramentally present, united with Christ, we offer ourselves as a sacrifice to the Father. When the bread and wine become the body and blood of Christ, why do they still look like bread and wine? Well, in the act of the consecration during the Eucharist, the substance of the bread and wine is changed by the power of the Holy Spirit into the substance of the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Now, at the same time, the accidents or the appearances of bread and wine remain. The physical attributes, that is, what can be seen, touched, tasted, or measured, still appears to be bread and wine. The change is at the deepest level of reality. By the consecration of bread and wine, a conversion takes place of the whole substance of bread into the substance of the body of our Christ, our Lord, and of the whole substance of the wine into the substance of his blood. This conversion is called transubstantiation by the Catholic Church.
This is a great mystery of our faith. We can only know it from Christ's teachings given us in the Scripture and in the tradition of the Church. Every other change that occurs in the world involves a change in accidents or characteristics. Sometimes the appearances change while the substance remains the same. Uh, For example, when a child reaches adulthood, the characteristics of the human person changes in many ways, but the adult remains the same person, the same substance. At other times, the substance and the appearances both change. For example, when a person eats an apple, the apple is incorporated into the body of that person. Uh, When this change of substance occurs, however, the characteristics of the apple or the accidents do not remain. As the apple is changed into the body of the person, it takes on the characteristics of the body of that person. Christ's presence in the Eucharist is unique in that even though the consecrated bread and wine truly are in substance the body and blood of Christ, they have none of the characteristics of a human body, but only those of the bread and wine. The only time we see the characteristics of a human body in Holy Communion is those Eucharistic miracles where the bread is visible as flesh and the wine is visible as blood, visually and scientifically proven. So does the bread cease to be bread and the wine cease to be wine? Yes, In order for the whole Christ to be present, body, blood, soul, and divinity, the bread and wine cannot remain, but must give way so that his glorified body and blood may be present. As St. Thomas Aquinas observed, Christ is not quoted as saying, This bread is my body, but he says, This is my body. Oh, How can that happen? It is a mystery that is accomplished by the Lord. As St. Ambrose said, If the word of the Lord Jesus is so powerful as to bring into existence things which were not, then a fortiori, uh, duh, those things which already exist can be changed into something else. Christ gives himself to us in a sacramental form that is appropriate for human eating and drinking. The presence of the body and blood of Christ cannot be detected or discerned by any way other than faith or through the Eucharistic miracles. As we saw in the survey, there are people who do not believe in the real presence, but believe that the consecrated bread and wine are merely symbols, and some Catholics believe that. What a shame. They need to listen to the truth of the Spirit, don't they? You need to share this information with them so that they can receive and repent their disbelief and come and receive the fullness of Holy Communion with the real presence of the body and blood of Christ in Mass. And those of you who are listening that are not Catholic, you can come and join the Catholic Church so that you too can receive the real presence of the body and blood of Jesus Christ. You are so welcome to come and join us. Another question. So, once and for all, are the consecrated bread and wine merely symbols? No, no, no. A symbol is something that points beyond itself to something else. The bread and wine are not a foreshadowing of the body and blood, but are truly the body and blood of Christ. This issue separates Catholics from virtually 
all Protestants. If Christ is only symbolically present in the Eucharist, then Catholics are guilty of idolatry. And some Protestants accuse us of that, but we're not. We do not worship mere bread and wine as God himself. Because if God is really present in the Eucharist, then most non-Catholics are guilty of not recognizing, in fact, denying and rejecting their Lord and Savior in the Eucharist. Both sides cannot be right. When non-Catholics celebrate communion services, they do not have the consecrated real presence, but only a symbolic look-alike that matches their beliefs. Perhaps a spiritual communion is how we might describe that. Since we are believers, it is inappropriate for us to partake in their symbolic communion. And so, one of the teachings of the church is that we should not participate in non-Catholic communion services. And sometimes when a family member participates because they are not Catholics, we feel that distance from them. We want to share Jesus with them. But that pain that we feel should help us to work even harder to bring all Christians into unity through the Catholic teaching of the real presence of Jesus. So, another question. Do the consecrated bread and wine cease to be the body and blood of Christ when Mass is over? No. They cannot turn back into bread and wine, for they are no longer bread and wine. Not at all. The church teaches that Christ remains present under the appearances of bread and wine as long as the appearances of bread and wine remain. When a consecrated host is digested or dissolved and no longer has the appearance of bread, it is no longer Jesus. Usually in the human body, that takes about 15 minutes. So Christ's presence in the Eucharist begins at the moment of consecration. And so you cannot add unconsecrated hosts that have not been on the altar if you see you're running short. Question number 10. If someone without faith eats and drinks the consecrated bread and wine, does he or she still receive the body and blood of Christ? Well, we have to qualify this answer. If to receive means to consume, the answer is yes, for the person consumes the body and blood of Christ. But if to receive means to accept the body and blood of Christ knowingly and willingly as to what they are, as to obtain spiritual benefit, then the answer is no. We do not receive Holy Communion. We are not in communion with the blood and body of Christ if we have no belief. Consume it? Yes. Communion with Jesus? No. A lack of faith on the part of the person eating and drinking the body and blood of Christ cannot change what these are, but it does prevent the person from obtaining the spiritual benefit, which is the communion with Christ. Such reception of Christ's body and blood would be in vain, and if done knowingly, would be sacrilegious. Reception of the Blessed Sacrament is not an automatic remedy. If we do not desire communion with Christ, God does not force this upon us. So what if a believer who is conscious of having committed a mortal sin eats and drinks the consecrated, even though he believes it is the real 
presence of the body and blood of Christ. Does he or she then still receive? Does he have communion with the body and blood of Christ? Well, the attitude and the disposition of the recipient cannot change what the consecrated bread and wine are. So the question here is not primarily about the nature of the real presence, but how sin affects the relationship between the individual and the Lord. So the person with mortal sin would not receive holy communion, but would consume the body and blood. Another question, does one receive the whole Christ if one receives Holy Communion under a single form? So like uh, perhaps only you partake of the cup or only of the host? Well, yes, because Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior, is wholly present under the appearances either of the bread or wine as the Eucharist. Furthermore, Christ is wholly present in any fragment of the consecrated host or in any drop of the precious blood. So why do it? Why receive both the body and blood of Christ? It is especially fitting to receive Christ in both forms during the celebration of the Eucharist. This allows the Eucharist to appear more perfectly as a banquet, a banquet that is a foretaste of the banquet that will be celebrated with Christ at the end of time, when the kingdom of God is established in its fullness. So, is Christ present during the celebration of the Eucharist in other ways, in addition to his real presence in the Blessed Sacrament? Well, yes. Let me distinguish three ways that Jesus can be present. First, Jesus is present everywhere as God, through his knowledge, power, and essence. Second, Jesus is present spiritually in those who are in a state of grace. Jesus is spiritually present in his word, in the person of the priest, in the assembled people, and likewise present in other sacraments such as baptism. And third, And especially, number three, Jesus is present in his flesh and blood in the Eucharist. We speak of the presence of Christ under the appearances of bread and wine as real in order to emphasize the special nature of that presence. The entire Christ is present, God and man, body and blood, soul, and divinity. This presence is called real, not to exclude the idea that the others are real too, but rather to indicate his presence par excellence, because it is substantial, and through it Christ becomes whole and entire God and man. In his glorified body, Jesus is present only in two places, at the right hand of the Father in heaven and in the Holy Eucharist on earth. By his real presence in the Eucharist, Christ fulfills his promise to be with us always until the end of the age. Through this gift of himself in the celebration of the Eucharist, under the appearances of bread and wine, Christ gives us the gift of eternal life. Amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day. Jesus says this 
For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Just as the living Father sent me, I have life because of the Father. So also the one who feeds on me will have life because of me. You've been listening to Truth of the Spirit. I'm Patty Bruner. And remember, there's more. With the Holy Spirit, there's always more. Be sure and check out some of our past episodes of this series, Basics of Faith. And you can check out my website, patriarchministries.com, for the details of each episode. And subscribe to have the next episode handy, which will include more truth of the Spirit. This is the Padua Podcast Network. Padua Podcast Network. Dot com.